Square One DSM is an initiative of the Greater Des Moines Partnership that mentors, connects, and enhances the potential for success for entrepreneurs in Central Iowa. How's everybody doing? Welcome to the hottest day of the year. What's <laughs> going on? Well, I'm going to start that. I'm Mike Caldwell. I work with the work for the Greater Wine Partnership. I run something called Square One DSM, which is all the entrepreneurial activities of the partnership. Uh, it encompasses basically mentoring, consulting, counseling to startup companies that are trying to build something of scale. I don't work with traditional small businesses. In fact, we have someone here that does work with traditional small businesses. So. Um, but we do uh, a series of things, including networking events, educational events. Uh, we do startup stories once a month. Uh, we take December off, otherwise we do it every month. And I'll remind you that every startup story we've done in the last five years is online on our website. So if you want to go back and look up, there's some really funny ones. Um, we were talking last night, uh, Paul Sings with his college Raise your hand. Paul is a guest this week. Uh, Jeff Wood brought him in on a tour called Biotech Tour. Paul's an uh, angel investor, air streamer, uh, power skateboarder, uh, kind of tech guy. Um, we were talking last night, and we are talking about different parts of entrepreneurialism and, and grow companies and all this. And one of my favorite interviews ever was Ben Noam a couple years ago. One of the people in the audience says, what do you consider market acceptance? And then Dead Pan looked at him and said, a check that I can cash. Uh, that was kind of a brilliant piece. But there's some really funny things out there. Uh, next month uh, at our event, we have Tori and Carl Merritt's. Tori just happens to be with us today. Rocket Referrals is another local startup that is pretty much a bootstrap. And we don't hear a lot about bootstraps anymore, but it keeps on how much capital they raise. And, and Tori and Carl didn't raise any. And we're going to talk a lot about bootstrapping and, and the success they've had, because they have a lot of success. I don't want to ruin the thunder, but they're doing really, really good. They actually pay themselves. Now, that's the mark of a successful startup. They have cash flow and can pay themselves. And you have four employees now? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So that's next month. Uh, let's see, other than that, uh, we're going to try to you know, get a little cooler because it's too damn hot out. Uh, so my guest today is Katie Patterson. And welcome. And what we're going to do, our usual program, is I will talk with Katie. I'll be asking some questions of Katie here for the next 30 minutes about what she's up to. And, uh, she's, her company and her team are doing some pretty interesting stuff outside of the traditional work they do. And then I'm going to open up to questions. So I want you guys to be thinking about the questions you want to ask. Um, and I'll open it up and I'll pick you. And I apologize we don't get to everybody. And if you don't mind, I'll probably try to repeat your question. Um, so with that, welcome. I wanted to ask you, the first question I want to ask you, we were kind of in this big conversation last night. We're talking about failure and a bunch of us in the bathroom about failure. I know you built this thing, and we'll get into the little history. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of getting you cold with this, but are there any particular things that you remember from your career through starting this thing? You go, oh wow, that was a failure that I learned from, and I'd love to share it. Just today? Or no. from well, just today. <laughs> Honestly, I love those just today. Yeah, you got one from this you morning or this the whole six years. Or, yeah. or which ones are you interested in? Um, that helps them. I mean, the thing that I, you know, you ever notice you have to touch the stove? You can't yeah. tell anybody, don't touch the stove, you'll burn your hand, everybody's like, Lord, and you like, put their hand by the stove and see it's hot. Just trying to save people from burnt hand syndrome. Is there anything that really sticks out to you? Yeah, I think that's a great question. This morning I was actually just watching a mini video of the founder of Spanx said that one thing that changed her entire direction is that every night at dinner her dad would ask her, What did you fail at today? You he would never ask. Yeah. Anything like that. And I think that's so interesting that he, you know, because if you're not failing, you're not trying. Right. And I think that's obviously a great concept. You know, I would say we, there's been so many different things and, and all of that. Just last week, we have to make decisions all the time. Um, a huge state agency specifically reached out to me, asked us to submit an RFP. We are still a small team and RFPs probably take three days at minimum. It was about a $2 million RFP. They had said they had specifically thought of us for this. And at the end of the day, I know it seems crazy, but a month just wasn't enough time for us to get that done. And we flat out decided to um, not submit to it. You know, even the director had reached out to me. It was a really hard decision, but we had four huge RFPs up. I had to choose one to bail on, and the state ones we could just have higher requirements of different documentation you have to do. 
I don't think I've slept since last Tuesday since we didn't submit it because I knew that we had an amazing shot at it and what direction would have that taken. But I know that taxing my team and reminding myself that you know the other opportunities are ones we wanted more and saying no can sometimes be a really positive thing of what's a good fit. Um, and so, but it does feel like a huge failure. Like what would have that gone? You know, I can't stop wondering like what other opportunities would that have opened up for us and things like that, but. Um, but you did it anyway. But we, I you mean, you just had to make that choice, yeah. We went through that one time with uh, my company, Walmart, on my purpose, and it would have destroyed our company to support Walmart or somebody. And they ended up going with their next competitor, which was twice as big as we were. And they didn't mean to, but they wrecked the company because they were just too big. We couldn't grow that fast. It's just a hard. It's frustrating, and I'm still thinking about it because it's the first thing that came to my mind, but I have to just think about what are we going to get because we didn't do that. So for those who don't know you here, and a lot of, us, a lot of people who probably don't know you well, tell us about the start of Happy Medium, kind of give us the, the overview arc yeah. from day one to here. Absolutely. So um, I started Happy Medium in March of 2011 on my own. My original business plan that I did with the um, Small Business Development Center says I have no desire to have any employees. And I'm proud to say we are a team of 22 today. <laughs> so executing business plans maybe isn't my strongest suit. But, um, you know, dreaming big is really something that I love to do. So I am not an entrepreneur who was born and was like dying to be an entrepreneur and had all these dreams to do that. That is not my story. Several pieces of my growing up story could have led you to where I was going to get to today. Like, um, you know, every single report card I have from the day I was in kindergarten says Katie is too bossy. Um, <laughs> and while that may be true, it did help, you know, build the foundation of being a leader. And I strongly encourage everybody to not call little girls especially bossy because I think that is um, a problem. Or rebel. Yeah. Rebel in their bossiness. It's a good thing. Yes. Own your boss. Just like bossy boys. Yeah. Um, and so I'm not bossy, I'm the boss, as Beyonce says. <laughs> and so, you know, a lot of that things happened. I was the top Girl Scout cookie salesperson in the whole nation and all these crazy things that um, my parents thought was, you know, just random, but all of that. And if you add all those pieces together, entrepreneur is probably something that was always in my core, but um, I didn't, I definitely sort of fell into doing it by just jumping on an opportunity. So when I first moved to Des Moines, I started at an advertising agency. I was there for about two years. Um, and then I moved to working at Channel 13 as an account executive on their sales team. All the foundation being built of having the agency <coughs> side and the station side, which I didn't know, but certainly was a huge help for me now. I had a client that asked if I would come work for them um, and manage all their marketing that I've been working with for a long time. And instead of doing that, I started Happy Medium um, on my own and was going to be planning to have them as my only client and outsource everything. I am definitely an account person. I am not a designer. Um, I am not a developer or things like that. And while I have significant understandings of all of those now, at that time, my knowledge base was none in those areas. So I wanted to outsource everything. Um, and where I couldn't find places to outsource to in the market was where I felt strong digitally with marketing. So. Um, I started implementing and managing social media for clients and making myself an expert in that, which trailed into all of the other digital things we do. Now, fast forward five and a half years, we consider ourselves a full, full service marketing firm, which to us means that we are just as strong on the digital side, meaning we build a ton of websites, we have internal UX, we do um, social media implementation, we do digital and traditional media buying all in-house. Um, and also have a full creative department and do all things a traditional ad agency would do. For us, this makes our team, although much larger than I could have ever pictured, a relatively still small team compared to other agencies. It makes us very movable and um, able to strongly implement a lot of campaigns because everybody works closely together, but we do everything in-house. So when our creative department is talking about the implementation, how a creative campaign is going to be served out on Digitally or traditionally, the media team is quite literally next to them and they can have that conversation and our projects are implemented, we believe, much stronger and better because of it. Um, about a year and a half ago, when as your company is growing and you get named some of these things like top fastest growing company in all of Iowa, everybody starts to ask you what's next and what are you going to do when you feel like you just already did it all. Um, and so. 
We, um, <clears throat> in moving into our new office, I wanted to our build out, we moved two years ago from an office of 500 square feet for nine of us to an office of 3,000 square feet for what we thought was gonna be maybe around 12 of us for the rest of our lives and is now 22, a year and a half later. Um, so we are back to um, touching elbows, but that's okay. And I wanted to ask, I wanted to have a TV up front in our welcome area to digitally be able to welcome clients. Um, and so as most, I'm sure, CEOs do, I just asked the developers if they could whip something up for me to do that. And they did a fantastic job with that. And of course, as developers do, when you unleash them on, on a project, they took it significantly better than I would have ever imagined they could have. So they're, um, ultimately what we created um, was a laptop attached to a computer at that point, running a fancy website, running social integrations and um, client you know, welcomes and photos and all of these different modules. We had started to have so many people come in and say, where did we get that? that we decided to have a fun project, quote unquote, to work on and build it as a software. Um, we were a team of creators, although when we, at our happy hours, we tend to play a lot of like, would you rather, or things like that games. And a few weeks ago, we played one where it was like, if you could pick one other person's position in the office to have for a day, not knowing you know your skill set and everything would be there with that position, what would you pick? And zero people picked my position. I was so almost <laughs> offended, but everybody did not want to be the CEO. They wanted to try development or design or you know making fun videos and everything. But they all do, although they don't want my position, they all have an entrepreneurial mindset and is a team of creators. So having a product for us to be able to test, try, and play on was a really great idea. So we then built that software for those initial clients that had asked to have that integrated there. And then we realized we were onto something. And so in the mix of going to a few different of the global tech conferences we always attend, and um, our leadership team working to de define who we are as an agency, we ultimately decided to become um, an agency that is at the core, a full full service marketing firm, but that launches its own products as we go about um, time. So Happy Boards was born, and um, that's where we are right now. And, and what I think was interesting, Happy Boards has a hardware component. Yes, Happy Boards does have a hardware component, which is where I met Mike, because I definitely know nothing about hardware. Um, so it runs from, we've tried several things over the last year that we wanted to use between Amazon Fires, um, Apple TVs, you know, Google Chromeboxes, Raspberry Pis, all of these different sort of devices that you attach to a TV that, um, you know, would then run, your, you know, whatever you want to cast up there. And um, so many of those didn't work. Raspberry Pi was probably the closest, but still didn't have exactly what we needed and would have needed more things built. We ended up engaging a hardware um, company out of Portland that helped us figure out exactly what we needed and then helped us to try and define if we needed a custom hardware or if there was a hardware out there that wasn't maybe mainstream that we hadn't tried yet. Um, they presented us with five different options and we ultimately um, move forward with something called the Rikomagic RKM22, and um, it's great. So it's great when you can get a hold of the people in China that you need to buy it from, and it's great when they respond, and <laughs> it's great when you figure out how to ask them questions or talk with them, or your senior product engineer has you know, so many firmware questions that then you have to develop and all these things. But it is great if we have found something, and um, where Mike came in was, me not knowing anything about hardware and coming home and saying, I need help. And so we are much further down that project, but um, it's still a really big process. And, and I think what's important is you're, this isn't just a single TV, I and mean, we've got new TVs in our lobby and are actually talking to her about it because you do need this way to deal with it. You put the TV up now, you don't want it on the same PowerPoint. Some places you go in, it's the same PowerPoint, and in fact, I was embarrassed that I was down at the DMV getting my driver's license renewed. And here's one of our partnership videos running, Loops, right? From two years ago. It's two years old, we're like, how did that happen? There's just no active way to manage the content. Right. You're seeing people that are very, very large scale saying, we have 200 TVs. Yes. What do we do with these? And I think, for the, just so you understand, the hardware is just an enabler. 
it's just a box. I mean, it's like a Chromecast. It's you know three inches square by an inch half thick. And you plug it in, it works. But it's really the software you guys built. Maybe mm -hmm. you can talk a little bit about the management of it. Because I think that to understand the scope of this is understand the complexities of saying, okay, I've got 100 TVs, 30 of them are in employee areas, 70 are in customer facing areas. And by the way, some of it needs to be different by the fact that one's in Cleveland, one's in Dallas, one's in. How do I do that? Yes, definitely. So, you know, the really interesting thing about us starting to launch products is that we get to essentially put ourselves in the same places that our clients are in, and that's one thing we really like about it. So we get to figure out how do we figure out what an audience is looking for. I mean, we have a whole UX department and we know how to do that, but how do we do it for ourselves? And then it's help us to be in their shoes. Um, so one thing we figured out for Happy Words was that we were unique in the market and we aren't just, you know, I think a lot of times when you're inventing things, you can say, well, we're just digital signage. And that is definitely not the case, but you do have to define how you're different and what your um, product is. And for us, one differentiator that we noticed immediately when we started looking, A, we were shocked that there was very little competitors in this market, which is a reason that we picked this, because this is not the only idea we have. We have to work very hard every day to not do the thousand other ideas that we have. Um, we slash I. And so, <laughs> stay focused. And um, so we figured out initially that there aren't a lot of competitors in this space. And then we also figured out that the competitors that are in this space, the people are frustrated with how their software is not UX friendly or, you know, isn't really remotely accessible or all these different problems. So one of our first clients we developed this for was currently um, burning 20 DVDs every single month, then mailing their, it was a bank, then mailing those DVDs out to all their retail locations, and someone at the retail location had to, you know, open the package and actually put the DVD into the TV, and then only that content was running, you know, for those next 30 days until they got that next DVD. So now that bank, from their corporate offices, can go on, log into one area, build each of those playlists, which is what's running on each of those TVs, and, um, update it and then it's in real time. We also have in-screen preview um, in our software which makes us unique. Several of the companies that are competitors inside of their software, you still have to go to the TV to see what's going on and so ours, which is weird, um, but you on ours you can see exactly what's happening and what's going with there. We were approached by and have been by several AV companies who want to resell this because it's great for events where you're pulling in hashtags and dynamic content. One thing that's really different about our product is that um, it's our software is only allowing one piece of content, although dynamic, with background images um, to be on the screen at one time. Several people in the digital um, display or you know area have. If you go see a lot of these screens, there's like three different boxes. There's weather and there's you know news stickers like and yeah, it looks like CNN. There's too much going on. And through research, we figured out which um, is pretty obvious, but data helps you make decisions, is um, that you people can't absorb that much. They're walking by screen, they're already looking at their phones, they're like sitting in a lobby and they've been <coughs> probably their phone on and, and the screen. So what is the point of this TV and, I, and this software? And so being able to update in real time, but forcing only one thing on the screen at a time, although dynamic, is the direction that we're taking. We do get asked a lot now, like, hey, can you shove on a new sticker? And hey, can you do this and that? And the answer is just always no. That is available if that's what you're looking for, but that is not what we're trying to make our product to be. One of our product um, sort of icons and groups we look up to is Slack. Slack does a really good job of not calling themselves a chat system. If you're familiar with Slack, it, it is basically a much better chat system. But um, you could create channels. It's completely changed the dynamic of how we work at our office and things like that. But if you were to explain Slack, the best way to explain it is it's, it's chatting. You can chat with people on it. Um, and they do a really good job of defining the fact that they're not just that. Essentially, everything you do on Slack, you could do somewhere else, but they are trying to change the entire way that you work at your office or within your team or within your group. Um, so for us, 
we are also a company, and we sort of have stumbled on this um, in figuring out what makes us different. We are a company that puts a ton of focus on culture. We have an internal culture team. They manage our culture. Culture is a word that gets thrown a lot around a lot, and for us, culture is very actions, not words. We want to show you that we are building our culture. And one problem that a lot of businesses and teams have is how do you convey culture both to external people or internal people? This product does that. So we are now moving this product into a space where it's like explaining that if you if your if your happy board is running in your lobby and somebody's waiting to meet with you, if they're waiting out there for two minutes, by the time they meet with you, our whole goal of this product is that they will have a significantly better view of who you are as a company before they even sit down to talk with you. Our whole goal with internal, so this is a place where this is a product that might be running in break rooms, um, especially break rooms. We've had a lot of people reach out to us that run, um, you know, like, like Hormel Foods. They have all these people working in plants. A lot of those people don't do email, so how do you get information to them? You print out flyers and put them in their mailboxes, maybe, but obviously the world is changing. So putting this screen in their break rooms where those people are very, very dedicated to their breaks, they're going to take a break, they're going to sit in the break room, this is the way that everyone at the top of Hormel that's trying to convey culture can do that globally. So how do you support all this? I mean, you, are you, you're starting to bring on customers, people are buying them. Do you send them the box and they put it in themselves? Do you send somebody out? Mm -hmm. So I buy 50 of these and I want them in 30 cities now. What? Um, that's a good question. We have multiple different ways we can do that. Our UX department has been working very heavily on building easy to install um, things. Our developers have made the product, so the firmware on the product now, the minute that you plug that in, it automatically finds your internet connection, whether Wi-Fi or Ethernet, and then the first screen that you would see is the code that you type into the software. So it's a very easy process once you have the, um, the hardware. Right now, that hardware would be shipped from our current office here in Des Moines. We are working on getting it to be, once it's ordered through the site, um, shipped directly to you. Cool. So, you've got 22 team members now. Let's talk a little bit about getting from 1 to 22. And uh, a lot of people in here are hiring a first, second, third, fourth, fifth person. You've probably been through it more than 21 times. You probably have not everybody you probably made the full cut all the way. What have you learned about hiring? Hiring is something that I did not anticipate or see coming at all when I started the company, obviously, because my business plan says no employees. So that was not something I was planning for. But um, I was horrible at hiring the first two years. Horrendous. Mm -hmm. It was just awful. Why? Why are you horrible? I mean, you just are like, you're meeting with people and until you really know what it's like to hire and you've failed at it, at the, speaking of failing, um, failed at it so much, it's really difficult to find what you're looking for. And hiring still, even though we've gotten so much better at it, there's so many catches we have now, there's so many different things we have in place, you still are sort of shooting an arrow into the wind when it comes down to it. People can be really, really, really great interviewers. Um, we don't hire anybody anymore without doing some sort of challenge. So whether you're getting hired you know, to be the new executive assistant at our office or the senior product engineer, there is some sort of challenge you will do um, at your final round to be hired at our office. Can you give us an idea what a challenge is? Yeah, so for example, obviously a developer challenge or different things like that are much easier to come with, up with. But we don't only do, um, you know, we don't only give you some sort of developer challenge where we want to see you have put together a basic site or, you know, something like that. We also do quizzes. So, you know, we want to know what your PHP skill set is through a quiz or things like that, and we do it timed. Although we're fine with our developers, of course, as they do Googling and researching to find answers, we just want to know where your skill set is and what we're getting when we hire you. But for an executive assistant, she had to um, put together with very little direction, um, a crazy travel week that I had. We just said, this was a real travel week I had. We need you to plan it. And we don't really give a lot of direction. And there really isn't a lot of right or wrong answers necessarily with the challenges that we're doing. It's just that we want to see how you execute that. How did you present that information? What did you think about? So the person that we ended up hiring, she even, you know, in explaining why she picked what she picked, you know, I think the final thing that solidified me picking her was, She's like, well, it's a Friday, um, and I picked to, although you're leaving early in the morning, I figured you'd want to be home in time to put your son to bed. 
which is a priority for me that I didn't have to convey to her, but I could tell she was already going to be great at sort of thinking at all the different things. So, and she was a pretty quiet person when she was interviewing, so she may not have been somebody I would have just happened to hire. So if I come in uh, through the queue and get a first round cut of job, how many times am I coming through and how many people am I meeting with? You are meeting at minimum with our entire leadership team at some point in the process, which is a total of three. Um, including myself, and then you're meeting with your department head if that's not one of those people, and then a person, one member of our culture team meets everybody. So you're coming in at least three times before you do the challenge. Wow. So how's that working out now? I mean, do you feel like in year five, what you're getting for hiring, you're, you're doing a better job? I mean, has it made a big difference? Well, at one point in my very early career, I hired somebody who two weeks into it asked me for a meeting and told me he wasn't sure if he would less rather work for a female or less rather work for somebody younger than him, of which I qualified for both of those roles. So um, I haven't hired anybody like that in a while. Um, so that's positive. We're doing better at figuring that out. But um, yeah, I think it is. I think the culture team really became a huge piece of that and helping us define here's exactly what we're looking for and we are not afraid to not hire somebody um, based on skill set. So if they have a great skill set but they are going to not be a great culture fit, we are nearly at a 50-50 um, judgment basis on that. Tell me about the financial side of your business. Did you have a financial background when you started this business? No. I always say I went into advertising because I don't do math. Um, and so, <laughs> talk a little bit about what you've learned in financials. Sure. Well, Accounting Kevin, as he is um, delightfully called at our office, he... Accounting Kevin. Accounting Kevin. For some reason, when I started the company, between the IT person I had and a bunch of them, they were all Kevins or Dave, so everybody had to get um, tagged with what your role was here. Um, so Accounting Kevin, he's been with the company since it was three months, and he helps through so much, of course, and so much growth. I bootstrapped Happy Medium, so the first year and a little over a year and a half, I took zero paycheck. I just kept reinvesting it in the company um, as I started to hire team members, and he's worked a lot through that. He helps us make decisions, and the really crazy part is now that we're this size, uh, we've never taken a loan, we've never done any of that, we've never had any debt, and now we're getting to the point where we may have to because of our size. And Kevin always reminds me that that's normal, but I, um, I'm still thinking about it. And so, you know, that is something that's really hard for me to grasp. So are you dealing with balance sheets, income statements? Yes, every time? single week I look at all of our financials, and every single week we have... Um, so every, I'm going to repeat that, looks every week for all of you out there with financials, she looks at them every week. Yes. <laughs> Every <laughs> week yeah. you need to know what the net is in your account and what you're planning for. And so, you know, um, I feel like one of the best pieces of advice I got when I started the company and started hiring was hire what you're not great at and do what you love to do. I'm horrible at numbers. I told Kevin when I met him, you need to be strict with me. Do not take my word just because I'm the CEO of the company. If I tell you I don't want to review something or I seem like I'm not understanding, force me to because that's just the kind of relationship that we have to have. It is not my strong suit, uh, but I can tell you down to the penny what I was told last Thursday of about all of our financials and what we're planning you know, as we grow. Because now we're getting into things that we've never had to do before, like purchasing inventory. I was gonna say, that leads me back to welcome to the hardware business. Yes. You, I mean, one of the challenges you have is you're growing, this is growing pretty quick on you. Mm -hmm. And now, and what, so what's the time from Placing an order with China to boxes on your doorstep. Two weeks, actually. You got down to two and weeks. And they will, um, they are installing our firmware from their end. So by the time they get to us, they are ready for us to turn around and Usually, ship That out. is pretty darn good, I gotta say, having done a lot of work with China, two weeks is great. Yes, we're very excited about that. And that has to be a minimum of a 50 order, though. So at that point, then, I have to be prepared to spend several thousand dollars to get that all here. and. You know, but even though it is such a new product, when people purchase it, they get so excited to have that. And some of the very, very large companies that we're talking with right now where this product would be implemented globally, we don't have an answer yet as to how that would roll out. And we've been just, especially in, you know, some of the bigger meetings we've been in, we've been very honest and fortunate to be able to say, listen, this is where we're at in this product. We know that this can be a great fit for you. I do not have a perfect answer to how I am going to um, you know, get all of this installed in your offices in China or things like that. Yeah, and I think that I would add here, one of the reasons you can get it too is you're buying a standard product mm -hmm. but putting a custom software right. load on it. And it's a good argument for doing standard hardware because I know our costs, we're not going to talk about them here, but 
the cost she's getting is very, very good. It's not perfect. There can be better things about the product, the out of box experience, right. those things. You know, we can make it better, but the cost difference, one, and then the time difference, because you'd be looking at 16 weeks, not two. Yeah. Minimum quantity orders of 500, not 50. Mm -hmm. And if you think about cost of inventory, so you order the stuff, it's in your office two weeks later, you get it out the week after that, you sell it to some big boy down the street here at HY or something, you're gonna get paid in 90 days. So suddenly you've got 120 days right. of cash out there, and the faster you grow, the bigger that pile of cash that you're having to finance gets, which is why right. in the hardware space, increased sales can break your back. And that's a really hard thing for entrepreneurs to understand. Because in the software world, as long as you can provision, increased sales is great, cash comes in, you get paid, you keep going. On the hardware side, suddenly you have this mountain of hardware you have to deliver, and you gotta buy more, and you gotta cash, you gotta buy more, and you gotta cash, constantly playing catch up. And I know we ran a quarter billion dollar line of credit just, just to procure the hardware mm -hmm. for our company. So I would imagine you are looking at lines yes. of credit we even had to recently switch banks. When I started the company, my personal checking account was at Bank of America, so that's where I started the company checking account. And because we haven't needed a banker relationship or anything up till now, um, that's where it's always stayed. So we have recently switched to a local bank, and I'm working with um, local bankers. And although we don't necessarily need that line right now, now is the time to have that conversation, not the day that I need it. As accounting Kevin has told me. <laughs> Well, for those of you who have bootstrapped businesses that never borrowed money, welcome to borrowing money as a commercial, you know, on a yes. commercial site. You know, one, you still get to sign for it personally, and two, it's a lot harder than personal money. There's a lot more involved uh, in borrowing money, so you really have to do it very early. Uh, I guess one thing I really want to ask you about is, is how are you going to deal with sales long term? So, I mean, are you going to fly around the country and sell this to everybody? Mm -hmm. what, what's your, are you going to staff up sales? Are you going to use the channel? Well, someone I met with had a really great recommendation, you, um, to, you know, when we started getting approached by AV companies and different people that wanted to resell our product, it started to be really obvious that that is a really great space for us to be in. So, um, although you can buy our product directly, where we are going much more to market is through those third party sellers. We've actually even already found a lot of great options with resellers in other agencies like us who work with clients who are trying to help them figure out how even internally do they um, convey their message, their branding, everything like that, who have several clients like we do that would be great fits for this. So reselling is definitely the approach that we are going to take. We are not looking at this time to do different reps in different markets, all of that. We are much more focused with this product on the monthly subscription. It's $100 a month for your playlist um, and there's no contracts with that. So once you own the product, you own it. You can up those amount of playlists, so whether you're principal financial group buying this product or um, you the know partnership. the partnership, you are paying the same exact every single month. We know that those larger companies are going to need significantly more playlists and different versions of what's playing. The partnership just needs probably one thing to run on this television. Principal wants something different on every single floor in different every single building and every single um, market that they're in. So that is how you know that works and that's why the pricing is the same for everybody but the resellers is has been a really really great fit for us yeah i think one of the reasons to me is you know if you look at this beautiful brand new building we have all of the AV was done by one company and if anything goes wrong with it we call them and if we want to attach something to it we really have to call them because they're the ones responsible that the remote works and the mics work and all that so those are the people who a lot of times have the trusted relationship with the end client and are trusted to make sure the TVs work and turn on and more importantly, replace them with the free right. ones when they come through. We absolutely feel like we are solving a problem of how to communicate culture, but the second problem that we're solving is all of these people over the last six or seven years that have built really fancy offices, put TVs everywhere, and have absolutely no game plan of what to put on the TVs. They're running CNN mm -hmm. on you. That's their plan. Uh, I'm going to ask for more questions, then we're going to open it up and start thinking about your questions. So what's the next product? TBD. Um, TBD. We actually have a few different plug-in type products that the developers are really excited about. We have a, a, a product that we're really excited yeah, about. Yeah, <laughs> so let's open it up for questions. Um, curious to hear what you all have to ask. What's your IP strategy? What's your IP strategy for Happy Boards? 
So what's your intellectual property yeah. strategy for IP boards or for happy boards? Um, in the same as Happy Medium, where there's just not as much IP, obviously, we believe that if you do the product right, that we'll be ahead of everybody. We do have our trademarks on it and certain, obviously, the legal things that we can do, but the software, there isn't a lot of space because it is just a software um, that we have a lot um, to protect, but we feel confident in the problems that we're solving and being first out with that, that we've protected ourselves in all the areas that we can and everything else. Um, we are a company that believes that doing things the right way and worrying only about that rather than worrying about the what ifs to some capacity is the approach that we take. I was uh, kind of wondering when it came to the certain screens that you were going to show, I'm guessing when you started developing, you were going to start reaching out and trying to understand, take all the developer ideas and figure out here's one screen idea, here's one thing that they, they can put in. Um, how did you go about that process of deciding which of the actual end, end screens that people are going to see and which ones you actually threw out? What was that process like? So our software is module based. So you get to go in, log into our software, and then there's all sorts of module options. So some people think it's really great to, they need more hashtag based type modules, some need videos, some need different social platforms, some need full screen, um, some need greetings, all different things. So it really works as a playlist where you build any module that you need and then you drag and drop your playlist in there and then you can drag and drop within that about the order that you want that playlist to go or the frequency. When it comes to the modules, you decide to give the customer on. How do we decide that? How do you decide which model? Yeah, so um, right now it is a mix of what we needed initially and solved our own problems. And then we do work, and I think that this comes back to the piece of the creators in our office. We go to a ton of meetings and have for the past year and a half where we've been pitching this and they say, does it do this? Could it do this? And all of that. And some of the answers are yes, we would love to do that. Like just this week we're at a meeting. You can time the greeting, so you know you can go in for the whole year or however long you want and time it to say, um, Katie is speaking today at noon to one, and then that screen would have said that the whole time, and 15 minutes before that, it would have showed up, and 15 minutes after that, it would have left on its own. Um, but where we don't have timed options is in the full screen slideshow module. So if you have a full screen image coming up that you're trying to convey something to your team, it's not timed in there. So a client recently this week said, would that be possible? This is a problem that we're really having. So that is something we're moving forward and implementing. Um, we don't just make modules to sell modules. We make them strategically. So before we add anything, UX would get a say and then, you know, to do their work, development and design. Um, and just to be clear, I'm going to walk back forward so you know, going to keep going. Sorry. Um, just to be clear, you're not doing different software for different companies. It is one software. Oh, yes. Everybody has the same set, so you're not going really custom. Yeah, and one thing that we wanted to be really passionate about is because we are doing this primarily because we love creating things, and we think we're solving. We solve our own problem, and through that, if we get to solve other people's problems, that's great. So as we are launching new modules that go within there, we have made an active decision that we're never going to charge you more to reach a higher level module or something new. Each month, there's potentially updates or releases that have been done. Um, and we'll let you know about those. One really cool thing and a big problem we solved that um, competitors are so, also aren't doing that I want to give credit to the development team is in the firmware that we built, they found a small startup called um, Kiosk Browser, which basically helps you remotely access all of this hardware. Um, so the initial problem we had was installing this everywhere and then someone would call and say, hey, this isn't working and then our you know, engineer is driving to somewhere to go fix this. So our firmware now and working with that startup, they built a custom app for us um, that we can remotely see and manage every piece of hardware we have no matter where it is. And, and you, so I take it you do upgrades on firmware and add software, you can you manage Yep, we can also do upgrades on your firmware, or on your hardware, I'm sorry, from remotely and that always happens. So each month now we're conveying to people not only what was updated on their hardware, which they probably don't care about, but we tell them, to what now is available in their software as they're logging in and what different options they can see. And as you think about building scale companies, if you're building hardware solutions, mm -hmm. software in the cloud is pretty easy to update these days, but hardware is still painful. So I mean, you really have to put a lot of thought into how are you going to scale when you have 10,000 of these in the field. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things she and I talk about. And you have four different versions of hardware. You have model 200, 201, 202, 203, and then you switch vendors. How are you going to support all five? And if you don't find a good path and partner, that could be what breaks your back. 
Again, you can fail through your own success, and that's the challenge. There's a benefit with hardware that once they have your hardware, they have yours. Absolutely. And once her device is on the back of our TV, the pain for anybody else to come in and get us to change boxes is going to be a mess. They're our barrier to exit. We're going to be like, are you kidding me? It works great. It's paid for. It's done. They take care of it. I don't care if you give me your box for free. I'm not changing because it's already in there at work. So that's the upside of hardware. But the downside is you better find a good man. Kiosk browser. Mm -hmm. They are very, very, very young startup that one of our engineers found. Reached out to them, asked if they could, if we could pay them to do some custom work for what we were looking for, and they've become really great partners in our product. Next. Yeah. Yes. Um, as you've gained traction with this product that you've launched, how is your team managing the support requests that are coming in for this versus everything else and the other services that you provide at Happy Medium? So if I can restate that, how are you load balancing all the other Happy Medium stuff with this new product venture? Well, you know, I think that that is a great question. We have focused mostly on doing, um, most of the people that we're working with now, we still have personal relationships with to some capacity, even though um, we're working certainly out of state or doing things like that at this point. Um, we have those initial connections and our UX department is still very actively involved with each of those customers, constantly asking them questions. We want all the feedback and all of that. So we're still in a phase where we want that day-to-day -day or you know question-to-question -question interaction. Um, but we are moving, working as this is scaling fast to a model of um, online support only. It is our goal through our UX department being so heavily involved with this that we will provide so many answers on our site and ways to help people and resources there. And also with the product being, you literally plug it into your TV and it does, it, you'll, an initial startup screen happens, all of that. It's, it's very, very, very simple um, to do that. That has solved a lot of those problems, um, quite honestly. And so we've been very fortunate since all of that has been built into it. Even the calls that we have with the people we work with have come down significantly. And then now that we're adding new modules, the monthly communication with people of what's available has also stopped a lot of those um, requests and entries. But we are definitely, like I said, the benefit to our team is we are a team of people who have entrepreneurial mindsets or are creative. So, so many of our team doesn't see this as work probably. They really enjoy doing it. We do not have, we've recently switched in the last few months to not having any specific office hours at our company. So we do not have office hours and we do not have set um, vacation. You have unlimited PTO when you work at Happy Medium and, and no office hours. Which means that a lot of times I wake up and there is a new website that has been built overnight, you know, or different things like that. But um, enabling them to work when they need to and have time off when they need to, to rather than restricting office hours and also having people contacting them at different times has been a culturally strong approach over the last few months that we we do know. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, so, so how many hiring failures did it take for you to implement a challenge, and then were those really failures because of skills or cultural fit? Um, actually, my current account coordinator, for whatever reason, this morning just said he was the last person who squeezed in without having to do a challenge. So that would have been about two years ago. So a lot. Um, and, you know, what was part two of your question? Was it cultural fit? Oh, cultural fit. Both, you know, like, and, and we've even had to get better about doing those challenges. So the first challenge we did um, quite a while ago, and we used to do challenges for some departments, like things that are easier to do challenges, like a design challenge or a dev challenge or a um, social challenge or things like that. But um, the first, very first challenge we did, we emailed it to the person and then said, next week when you come meet with us, we need you to have X ready to go. And this person nailed it, like nailed the presentation. I was like, this is the best hire we've ever had. And I was probably like two years into the company. And then they started and we figured out everything takes them 18 times as long as everybody else, which we did not catch because we had sent it home with them. So now all challenges are done in our office um, and, and, and things like that, except for developer ones. Those are done remotely because sometimes um, they're not here when we're hiring them. And, their time, so that's how we track that. What do you say that people fail the challenge? Well, there's not failure. We don't. That's not like the nice word. But um, <laughs> they don't fail. It. They maybe just. It, it really has become a place where people. The whole weird thing about hiring is that. What are you going to know about? I'm, I'm going to add you potentially to my team, and our team's still small enough that we're still hiring people that will be potential owners in the company someday. Maybe I don't know, but we're only five years in. So it's a really intimate thing that we're still hiring for. And um, 
you know, it's not necessarily that they fail, but there's just certainly better fits in different places. So people, like I said, it's crazy how great people are interviewing and how bad they might be at their job. And so the challenges has helped us unveil what maybe great inter people who aren't great at interviewing are in with skill set. You can tell me you're great, but I would like to see it. Do some of the key people who are working with Happy Boards have ownership in the company? No, at this point, Happy Boards is still a subsidiary of Happy Media. Um, when we started this product, so I was approached two years ago by, um, it's out there, but Gannett Media for acquisition of Happy Media. I was not looking for acquisition. They literally just asked me for a meeting to come in. I thought they were going to complain to me that my media buyer doesn't buy the newspaper for our clients. Um, and the conversation was completely different. And so um, ultimately through that, I decided I didn't even want to see an LOI. I wasn't interested in selling at the time. And, um, but I was comfortable with potentially our products being things that we sell off of the company. Happy Boards is unique and in talking with Mike and other people too that um, this is a subscription based model so this one's a little easier for us and doesn't have as many service needs. It's a little easier for us to keep, keep. Um, but as we build products our goal would potentially be to sell those products off and keep the core of the business. Um, at this point I am the 100% owner in Happy Medium. Can I ask you a question off of that? Sure. How do you motivate the employees who are working on it, especially hard, um, when they don't have that equity stake like, like a normal startup? Um, I think that, I'm not sure, I guess they just really like our team and our culture. I think that I know for a fact Cody, who's our product engineer on this, went from a job where he was like expected to bang out a bunch of websites just constantly and he had no control over the process and although our company does things completely different on that capacity alone and that would have fulfilled him a lot more developmentally, I think. Um, you know, he loves that he gets to sit at home whenever he wants or work from wherever he wants and has so much control over this project. You know, we're still a small team, so our people aren't being told necessarily what to do. I expect them to be the people figuring out what we're doing. And that alone has been, you know, a huge probably um, piece of what they really like doing. They're not just an engineer, just on a team being said, here's what we're developing today. It is them getting to figure out the problems and finding the solutions and then ultimately getting to build those. Right here in front. So uh, two quick ones. First, specifically about the product, um, because my plan is going with that, but um, so you purchase the hardware mm -hmm. for each location, and then there's a subscription to the software that's per playlist. Mm -hmm. So if you had 10 offices and you ideally wanted something different playing in Tampa and Chicago, because mm -hmm. I, I work with an architecture firm, so yeah. they like to show architecture that's mm -hmm. specific to that region, um, then that would be per per playlist. Yep. Okay. Yeah, but you would just, that, that company would just buy their licensing once. So they would own all of that and then be able to play those playlists on as many screens as they wanted to. So you're able to play that playlist that you're purchasing for $100 on unlimited amounts of screens. So if they had 10 TVs in their office, they would only be paying. So the single playlist, but then if you want to differentiate it, then you're going to pay 100 Yeah, I think the, or, yeah. the point is that no matter how many TVs are involved, each playlist becomes a subscription. Yes. Okay. Because if you think about someone like a principal that's very, very large, the amount of support from all versus us doing the one play this at home. Yeah. So. I was just, that the reason why that was coming through my mind is because I think one of the unique value propositions is being able to change the playlist, but at some point, when you're wanting to do events and you have mm -hmm. two different offices, it could get really unreasonable in terms of price. Yeah, so, and our model too is within the software, you can upgrade and downgrade, so, and it's prorated. So when you need another playlist, you upgrade to it, even if you just needed it for that day, and then you downgrade the next day. Okay, that's good. It's all managed and, handled within the software and built-in. So, two unrelated questions. The first has to do with um, what you said about, and I love it, that your staff, no vacation days. I mean, they can, they have- They have unlimited vacation days. Not no vacation days. <laughs> 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 no matter what they say. Unlimited <laughs> vacation days, whatever. And no office hours. Yes. Do you have a non-compete clause? Yes. Okay, so that was a quick one. And as far as the creatives go, once you have a client that has bought your, they, they're now our subscriber, mm -hmm. 
they've um, bought the hardware. Mm -hmm. Do you provide creatives? Going back to the advertising side of it, do you, what do you do? We could potentially become a partner with that. Our Most people that we work with have their own brand standards and internal designers or designers that they work with that would design enough that would go on their boards. But we can definitely either implement or provide guidance on that. So what percentage then, if you were to think about a percentage, what percentage of your work, of your, your revenue is coming from the boards? Mm -hmm. what's, what's coming from the... That's a good question. Design? And that's up to you if you want to disclose it. Yeah. Okay. We don't, it, okay. no, I, if she wants to, that's fine. We just, I don't like what I think I will for today, yeah. Yeah, okay. it's kind of hard to break up, but sometimes it gets a little weird. We're going to look, did you have one more um, question? Just the, the other the second yeah. question was just about collaboration. Because I've been over to the Forge, and they have kind of an opposite model, a really cool space, and everyone can move around. Mm -hmm. But they're essentially there, and, and so it's more of a collaborative mm -hmm. environment. And so I love that idea of remote work, and um, I think that's great. But sometimes I was wondering if you could explain the challenge of people working all these different hours and in different places. No, and collaborating. Yeah. The challenge of an open, non hours. So we went to, we go to a lot of tech conferences and have um, a presence there as we're always trying to, you know, be leaders not only in this market but in general. Um, and I always come back with sort of one gem from one. One was this let's just not have office hours thing. And um, I think that's a scary thing. I pitched it to the leadership team probably four months ago and I was like, I think we should drop office hours. And then they both sort of just stared at me and that's really hard to get them both to do because one is a design brain and one is an accounts brain. So usually one's at least on my page and in this case it was just quiet. But um, <laughs> they, you know, were like, what if and what if and what if and what if? And um, I said, but what if people get to do a better product and do better work because they get to do it when it works for them? So we said we're gonna do an eight week trial and we're gonna see how it goes. If it was a disaster in the first week, obviously we can always undo it and, and start there. Um, and I said, I want to do as least parameters as possible because I wanna see where the pain points are if we're gonna do this. So the only parameters we put around it was, we worked from something, a project management system called Trello, if you're familiar with that, and, and Slack is how we communicate with each other. So, the guidelines with this were, you have to hit your deadlines, which is not a new guideline, and um, you have to be available to answer a question here or there when someone else is trying to move on with their project and get their things done. Um, so I was dying to see the Monday that we started this, how many people would show up at the office and when they would show up. Our hours previous to this were 7.30 to 5, Monday through Thursday, and 7.30 to 2.30 on Fridays. Um, and I went to the office at 7.15 or so that first Monday, and there was already two people in the office, and probably by 8 o'clock there was over half the office was in the office. Um, so that was fine that day, and that worked, and then the few weeks later, I was also really curious to see as people test the waters a little more, who would not come in, or different things like that. I've maybe seen one of our engineers like 10 times since this all started, and he's been he was always productive, but he's been incredibly productive since then, but he just works better in his own hours, in his own space, in his own group. Um, and then another guideline we did put around, we do feel like collaboration is a big piece of what we do. So we said, we're not gonna tell you that the hours you have to be here, but we do wanna see your face once or twice a week here. Um, and so we just decided to move forward with permanently implementing you know, hours like that. We have handled where we've had any potential issues. It is our thought always when we're rolling out these things that if we're having an issue, it's the person, not the not the concept or the thing that we're doing. If we're having an issue with this person, with this policy, it, it's not the policy, it's the person. I think that one of the big things I've seen with these kinds of programs is it really is up to the managers about how they manage. And if you manage to the task and to the result, it's pretty easy to do. If you're one of the people who wants to know if everybody's in their desk at five, um, that's usually what drives people to leave the company's good drivers, is the you're at your desk till five thing. And I think as long as you can go to truly, it's a little more challenging for the manager because you have to divide very specific results that you need done. And, and on big dev projects, that's a lot of interim steps. Mm -hmm. You need to be here by Friday, it needs to work. You need to be here, it needs to work. So it's, it, and I think that's where Slack and things like that come yeah. in because we were using these kinds of tools even in the 90s because we worked in Europe and Russia. We had engineers in 
Europe, we had engineers in Russia, we had a few engineers in China already. And you, you really couldn't just have a talk. I mean, here you just call it go talk to each other. It's really simple. And if you work through a system where it's all documented, it, it enables all that. I think that's what people in the Midwest especially still don't get as much as the coastline stuff people do, is these kinds of tools, while somewhat irritating in some ways, are so much more helpful because you can come out of it and go back into it and not miss out on what the three of us talked about 30 minutes ago because we're not talking in the hallway, we're talking on the system. Yeah, we do a lot of check-ins, of course. Mm -hmm. See where everybody's at, see if everybody needs help. Jeff, do you pay for Slack yet? And when did you decide to do it? Do you pay for Last Slack? week. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> when we could no longer access something in the archives that we needed to, um, an accounts person, Instead of crying, I committed to. Instead of crying, I committed to um, paying for Slack now, and that is working a lot better. We also are getting to a place where we have um, people that we're collaborating with that are outside of the me and team, and in order to be able to do that, we have to pay for it to have those extra um, tabs or channels. I'm not sure what they call those, but um, we started last week, and it was an immediate hooray from everybody especially the accounts people. So much happens now in, in their chatting. We try really hard to force so much of that to happen on Trello so it stays, but it happens in Slack. Yeah, I can't, I know, know Slack well, but I know one of its predecessor products and we were using it for the same reason. And when you can set up private rooms by customer, especially with your yeah. better customers, where your customers have the opportunity to say anything they want, whatever they want, you solve big problems really easily because, so let's say Bernard's my customer, if there's something going on at eight o'clock at night, he can say it. Now, he may not expect you to respond, but one of my people might respond to him. And even if not, they're going to see it at 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Go, wow, that's a priority and solve it. And he doesn't feel like, okay, nobody's paying attention to it. We have clients we Slack with now, too, a couple that we do huge projects for. So, that's... We have time for one more question. I'm going to take one in the back. How do you measure the effectiveness of social media other than people who just respond to a call of action, like when you're delivering content um, to try to get people to eventually do that, how do you measure the effectiveness? Measuring the effectiveness of social media other the than The ultimate people. question. <laughs> um, this is the, 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 the mystery. Yeah, we get that question a lot. And usually I respond by saying something like, I will show you how effective social media is when you're in the middle of a social media crisis. Um, when somebody has said something negative about your brand, when all of that, unfortunately, until then, some people just choose to see it as a necessary evil that you have to have a social media presence. We can certainly, and when we work with our clients, um, you know, for example, um, Come and Go is a great example. Anything you see implemented with Come and Go social media is coming from our team and we're working with them on all of that. And, um, you know, they have to have that strong presence. Can I prove to you that posts on their Facebook page or posts on their Instagram page are selling um, fountain drinks? Probably not, unless we do a very specific, specific campaign on social media that's only available through that. But what I can tell you is they have a strong community. They are able to get a lot of information of what's not working in each of their stores. They're a giant brand, and so um, it's really hard for them to get feedback from a tiny store in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to their corporate headquarters in West Des Moines. Um, but through social, we can get all of that. How's that? Because people will tweet a lot at you. Um, <laughs> because people take because their name is come and go, and you will get a lot of feedback on people's questions. Um, and so, you know, you you get to have this community, and it's interesting how social really does end up working with potentially UX and feedback and data, um, and getting all of that information, and how those departments start to work together. Um, through that and so certainly there's reports and all of those things that you would provide and that we do provide to clients but our measurement of successful social media truly is community building building and so if you have that presence and you're strong it will pay off it is harder to see you know how a tweet sold a survey okay I got to wrap it up as we were right at one o'clock can you stick around for a few minutes yes I will okay. be here Katie thank you for coming I appreciate it